you. Uh, and thanks again, everybody who's uh, come out. Um, to make long stories shorter, uh, we have a brochure. It's on the literature table there that explains what we do at Coffee Strong. Um, we're uh, an, a pro-GI, anti-war organization. Um, we used to be in the coffee shop business, but not so much anymore. Although we always keep a pot of free coffee going, so if you drive by and want some free coffee, stop in. Um, but mostly uh, what we do is we deal with uh, GI rights. Uh, this is uh, for active duty soldiers or uh, sailors or airmen, whatever, uh, uh, members of the armed forces who are uh, facing problems within their chain of command. Uh, uh, they've been you know, disciplined for one reason or another and uh, we try to help them uh, get uh, justice within the military. Uh, two, two seemingly contradictory <coughs> terms, you know, justice and military. Um, so uh, uh, we also help with the uh, veterans benefits. Dennis is uh, one of our independent uh, accredited veterans benefits counselors. And uh, uh, we help uh, GIs file for VA claims and appeals. Uh, when the claims are, you know, less than uh, adequate for uh, the, the, the GI who submitted claims uh, or they've been denied, we, we've helped them file appeals. Uh, we also do uh, uh, discharge upgrades uh, for uh, uh, people who got uh, a poor characterization on their discharge and need to have a, a, a higher grade of discharge to uh, access their benefits. So sometimes that comes first and then Dennis's work uh, uh, kicks in once they're uh, eligible for benefits. Um, Aaron uh, helps with the discharge upgrades. Aaron uh, over there, uh, there you are. Um, and uh, uh, then we also help with uh, a variety of other uh, civilian type legal issues that uh, active duty and veterans face uh, anything from uh, uh, domestic issues to landlord-tenant disputes and so on. So we try to uh, help out with, uh, we have uh, uh, a couple of attorneys that help us uh, advise uh, uh, people on how to proceed with uh, claims they may have in civil court. Um, so that's that's what we're doing in a nutshell. We also try to educate the public about uh, the total costs of war uh, and militarism uh, so that they can better understand that uh, uh, this is not, you know, militarism isn't some sort of remote issue, but it's a, a central issue in the way our society functions. And uh, uh, many other issues are, are intricately related. Uh, for example, Graham uh, has been involved in uh, uh, the Shell No campaign, the Kai activists, uh, and uh, the largest consumer of fossil fuels in the world is the United States military. So, and that's one reason we have such a huge military and why we continually uh, uh, project power in regions where we want so much, not uh, in necessarily to extract, but to control uh, oil reserves, natural gas reserves, and so on. So it's mostly about projecting power. Our policy is, our foreign policy is geared toward projecting military power so that we can control energy resources in the world. So that's just an example as to how uh, our um, military, um, as Eisenhower called it, industrial complex, um, helps determine a lot of our national priorities, our uh, um, uh, global priorities. Um, so, like one hand washing the other. Um, we, we are always looking for people who are interested in volunteering in one capacity or another. So there are some orange cards over there you can pick up and fill out an orange card uh, and let us have your uh, information where we can contact you. If you'd like to volunteer some time or have a special skill or talent that you'd like to offer. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, 
Media Island uh, International for welcoming us today and uh, sharing in this event. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to present uh, Graham Klumpner. Graham is uh, uh, an, uh, an army ex-Army Ranger uh, who uh, was uh, deployed in Afghanistan, Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, always so got yeah, everybody smiles. It, it's enduring anyway. Uh, <laughs> enduring is, yes. Uh, okay, um, so uh, Graham is going to talk to us about uh, uh, the changing face of uh, the global scene and how that uh, is likely to affect uh, our ways of responding to it. Um, so a lot of the rivers come through Turkey and then down and spread down into here and dissipate once you get down into these areas. So they're incredibly dry. Um, so the farther south you go, the less access to fresh water you're getting. And Syria, since the 1970s, has been ex experiencing a yearly decline in annual rainfall. Uh, in fact, since 1971, Syria has lost 30 days of rainfall a year. And that is drastic for a country that is incredibly based on uh, agriculture. So, as uh, you know, th this is this is problematic because climate change uh, is one forcing of many, many different forcings, whether they be political or economic or historical. Uh, but climate change, if you can imagine it this way, think of yourself as a nation state on a diving board. Climate change is the thing that kicks you off into the pool, and in our case, the pool doesn't have any water in it. <laughs> so. As, as the annual rainfall began to deplete, farmers, especially small farmers, began to, to go to their wells and dig up what was in aquifers. And that stuff only replenishes over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so they began depleting their local areas. Um, and this was coupled with two things. One was the Middle East moving from socialist governments into more uh, westernized capitalist uh, governments, oh. and they privatized everything. They began privatizing the water resources that used to be owned by the city. They began privatizing uh, the airports and the public, uh, the, the public works. Um, and as this privatization happened, they were also building massive dams in the region. So this happened in Turkey, it happened in Syria, it happened in Libya, it happened in Iraq. Um, but in Syria, the damming projects almost led to war with Turkey in the late 1970s. And so water became, as early as 1972, a massive resource that people were willing to fight over, much more so than oil at the time, actually. Um, then, of course, you have population growth in the Middle East, uh, population growth since the 1950s. As many of these countries gained independence, uh, population skyrocketed, double and tripling in some cases. So in 1970, you had 6 million people in Syria. Now you've got, at least before the war, you had 28 million people. Uh, so you've seen this massive shift in what can actually be sustained. Uh, and then infrastructure itself, like the Syrian state, uh, since Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad's father, the current president, uh, since he took over in the 1970s, uh, there's been a focus on infrastructure projects that directly benefited the state and didn't benefit the people of the country. So roads and bridges and you know public water access have all been depleted over that time. Um, and then... Of course, it leads us to 2007. And in 2007, any Iraq vets here want to tell me what was going on in Iraq? In Iraq at that time, there was what we call, the Americans called the surge. Right. And we were sending an extra 35,000 American soldiers into Iraq uh, to compensate for what was being called a civil war at the time. Uh, over 4 million refugees left Syria, or excuse me, left Iraq, many of them going into Syria, because Syria is north of Iraq. So these refugees put a massive strain on an already strained social structure in Syria. And the dictatorship in Syria refused to respond. So people needed access to more food and water, and you already had farmers who, remember, were being pri had their farms privatized and, not, and their aquifers depleted. These farmers were moving into the major cities, and then coupled with immigrants and refugees coming from Iraq. And this put a massive strain on the government of Syria. And then, climate crisis. A drought kicks in at the end of 2007, and this drought has lasted 
from 2007 until 2011. So you had a five year drought almost that uh, basically did that thing I talked about on the, on the diving board, literally pushing them over. I think it's important to really, to not, so I, what I'm not saying here, I'm not saying that climate change created the civil war. I'm saying that climate change exacerbated existing problems in the world. It added that extra 5% that people just couldn't handle anymore. It pushed those, those boundaries. And the biggest single event that caused the current crisis in Syria is the Iraq invasion in 2003. So we can say whatever we want about weapons of mass destruction. I think that that's a narrative that we, um, we're missing an opportunity to, on the left to talk about systemic militarism in the world and imperialism in the world when we just mention the weapons of mass destruction. Because the weapons of mass destruction, whether they were there or not, doesn't justify an invasion. Let's say that, they had, let's say that we had found sarin gas or VX gas. It wouldn't change the fact that we invaded a sovereign nation. It wouldn't change the fact that it was a strategic blunder. It wouldn't change the fact that one million Iraqis had been killed by the United States occupation. None of those things would have changed. So when we, when we focus solely on the weapons of mass destruction, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, that war was messed up, but mm, bombing Syria, bombing Libya, bombing Pakistan, bombing Yemen, bombing Somalia, bombing Afghanistan, that's okay. But occupying Iraq because we lied to the American people and it was Bush that did it, mm, that messes up. You know? So I think it's important for us to understand that these things are, like, this is a policy of which Iraq is a really, really big, bad example of what goes wrong when you occupy other countries. I talked about the refugees earlier, but I think it's really important because we're starting to see uh, for the first time in the American media what it looks like to have climate refugees. But climate refugees have been going on for as long as there has been people on this earth. Um, in fact, most of the refugees that left Iraq were uh, responding, especially in northern Iraq, were responding to a drought that had happened in their region as well. So uh, as we look forward to you know, the winter here, there's been a lot of talk, not here, but in Europe, there's been a lot of talk that the refugee crisis in Europe is going to abate uh, because, of the, because of the weather, uh, or that people can build borders, or that the military can respond in a way that keeps refugees from coming into their region. This problem, uh, there's an there's a author, Christian Parenti, who did a fascinating book called Tropic of Chaos, and he was one of the first thinkers to start looking at what is climate change doing for refugee populations, how is it creating them and pushing them. Uh, and I encourage everybody to look at that. But he looked at um, a number of centers around the world, and I've got a map at the end of this that I'm going to show you the top 20 most climate challenged cities and places on the earth where the U.S. military and NATO are looking at this as the top conflict areas in the future. And you'll be surprised because two of them in the United States. Uh, yeah, and the other thing is just the Greater Anatolia Project was like this massive public works investment program that was going on um, under the Syrian government. It, it's something that we've talked about in the United States as a massive investment. What if we had a new green jobs program or we had a new civilian conservation corps for climate change? Uh, it's important to think about like the effects of that. You know, 70% of our energy in this state comes from dams. Um, so we're actually, you know, like... We're in a situation where we don't use a lot of coal, we don't use a lot of uh, fossil fuels, that, or traditional fossil fuels, um, but it takes a lot of fossil fuels to build those dams. A lot of those salmon can't die up the river and provide the nutrients. So there are like, we have to think about consequences. We can't just keep uh, having these one-off reactions where we have a problem and then we have one solution. We've got to start thinking a lot longer term because climate change is creating uh, it's called stochastic effects. It's unpredictable, multiple scale effects that happen. Uh, and we need like systemic policy shifts and predictions to be able to adjust to that. So what happened in Syria? Uh, in 2011, the Arab Spring was sweeping across the world or across the Middle East. And I think probably all of us in this room were cheering and very excited to see this. Uh, what we heard from for the first time since 9-11 really in our media was people of Arab backgrounds and uh, a lot of Muslims in the region demanding democratic, free conversations, representation, using the word freedom, 
um, demanding open assemblies, nonviolence. Uh, and these were, these are not new concepts in the region, but these were new to the American people to see this and for a lot of folks in the world. Um, after, after Tunisia, uh, Ben Ali in Tunisia fell, uh, and then Mubarak in Egypt fell, every single political pundit and military expert and government official, if you had asked them, would have told you that Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, was next. Even Russia the biggest patron, the biggest supporter, the one who is now flying missions for uh, the Syrian government, even the Russian government thought that Bashar was going to fall. And he hasn't fallen. In fact, he's probably stabilized himself more than, better than anybody else in the region. Um, he created a coalition. He's, a minor, he's from this minority group called the Alawites, and he created this coalition uh, of, 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 uh, within the Syrian framework of oppressed peoples. So the Sunni are the majority, and he created a coalition of all the other people against the Sunni population. Uh, and this has allowed him to stay in power because there is this fear that a backlash, like what happened in Iraq, will happen. Um, so, so the drought's hitting, right, from 2007 to 2011. And the protests come to a little city called Dara in Syria. And a couple of kids <coughs> spray paint on a wall <coughs> down with Assad. They're like 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds. The kids disappear and a week later they end up in bags, in pieces, on their parents' doorsteps. The place explodes. And the government troops start shooting back against nonviolent protesters. And the revolution quickly spreads from Dara to Aleppo even to Damascus, where the center of power is, and you see uprisings all over the country of people not armed taking on government troops, and you see government troops defecting and refusing to shoot their own people. And this is when everybody's like, oh, the next thing is, you know, Assad's going to fall. Assad doubles down, sends troops in into all these cities and starts just shelling and bombing and using indiscriminate violence against civilians, hoping to scare them uh, back into their homes. And there is a precedent for this in Syria because in the 1980s, Bashar's father, who was president at the time, Hafez al-Assad, uh, he encountered a similar protest from a group called the Muslim Brotherhood in a city called Hama. And in Hama, uh, he basically came in, surrounded the entire town, and leveled it. It's worse than what we did to Fallujah in Iraq. Like, literally leveled the city, killed 25,000 people, and protest over. So in Bashar's thinking, as best as we can tell, he's looking at this like we can do the same thing. We'll put down this uprising, use incredible force. What he didn't count on was the fact that the rest of the Middle East would start funneling guns and money. In. So other countries like Qatar and the United <coughs> Arab Emirates, and I know there's a lot of like moving pieces here, so don't, it's more about the key concepts, not, you don't have to remember everything, this isn't a class. Um, no but no tests at the end. Uh, I will simplify it then. Yeah, um, but a number of a number of resistance groups formed. The, the the first one that was most famous was the Free Syrian Army. It was supposed to be a secular group, um, and initially it involved a number of former officers of the Syrian military who had defected. Uh, and for the first six to eight months, they were the primary opposition to Assad's forces. Uh, but then you started getting countries like Saudi Arabia to start wanting to fund, and they did the exact same thing that Saudi Arabia did in the 1970s and 80s in Afghanistan. They began funding the most religious zealots, the Sunnis who fit their ideology. So imagine like the KKK of Christianity, that's the type of people that Saudi Arabia was choosing to fund in Syria and exploiting this climate crisis. So as the Syrian government is fighting the Free Syrian Army. They're kind of taking each other out. You start seeing this rise of other groups called Al Nusra, uh, which is an Islamic uh, fundamentalist organization that believes kind of in a caliphate, kind of in a global uh, Islamic government. Uh, and then, you know, later on we see ISIS. But that doesn't come around until about 2012. Um, and the country, I mean, Syria is a very. You know, like any of the countries in the Middle East where the British drew, and the British and French drew maps, the French drew these maps. Um, 
there's incredible like sectarian and political divides that exist um, that were really like exploited and pushed by the United States when we were over there uh, for our own benefit. Um, so we looked at like again, this is an example of those those one step ahead thoughts that we have instead of seeing twenty steps ahead. So in Iraq, for example, uh, Saddam Hussein was one <laughs> political and and sectarian group, and we played his group off of the, against the other group. And that created, in a lot of ways, the civil war that came. Same thing happened in, in Syria. And many of the people, those folks who are Iraq vets in this room, many of the people that um, you all were fighting in 2006, 2007, uh, during the, the Sunni uprising and then the Sunni awakening, these are people we paid, the United States paid, to not shoot at us anymore. They're now fighting the Syrian government. And there's a small, if not funny, irony in all of this, is that during the Iraq, the initial Iraq war, a lot of money that uh, the Sunni groups were receiving came from Bashar al-Assad's government. And now they're fighting him. Um, so, irony. Uh, so anyway, there's, there are a number of countries. This has essentially a, become a proxy war. Uh, where around, a little over 400,000 people are dead. And what I mean by a proxy war is that you have superpowers and other powers utilizing Syria as a way to uh, take out aggression on each other. In some ways, Vietnam was a proxy war between us and the Soviet Union. In some ways, the Afghanistan invasion by the Soviets was a proxy war between us and the Soviets. Um, so this is kind of a proxy war between a number of important players. And this is important to understand right now because, uh, for example, this morning, Turkey's election results came in. And if you've been like watching Democracy Now! or paying attention, you've seen some bombings recently in Turkey. Um, so there, like, there are some incredible leftists in that region that are doing incredible work, and they're being targeted by the, the Syrian and Turkish governments. They're being targeted by ISIS, and, and by proxy, they're being targeted by the United States because we support Turkey. Um, and all of these things are really important for us to understand because of a political movement that has emerged in this region. So this is Rojava. Who's heard of Rojava in here? Yeah. Cool. So Rojava, yeah. who's heard of the Spanish Civil War? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So everybody here has heard of the Spanish Civil War. I don't want to make a direct comparison here, but there's a lot of interesting comparisons. Um, so Rojava is a region of Syria. It's in the northeast. There's about two and a half million people that live in this region currently. Uh, it's broken into three different groups that are called cantons, or we could call them like counties, basically, large counties. Um, and in this region, an autonomous, non-hierarchical social structure has emerged out of the Civil War. So what we see in the media is we see ISIS. We see these people, you know, beheading people, sex slavery, all these like horrific, incredibly uh, disturbing images and ideas. But on the flip side of that, we've also seen um, as a response to the chaos and understanding by people who have been oppressed for a long, long time that we need to that they need to find ways across political and sectarian boundaries uh, to come together. What has happened uh, in this region is what is being called democratic confederalism. Um, so, another weird history lesson: in the 1970s in Turkey, there was. <clears throat> Uh, a dictatorship and a leftist <coughs> student uprising began. Uh, some of they're, they're basically demanding the same types of rights that we uh, saw demanded out of the Arab Spring. And out of this came an organization called the PKK or the Kurdistan Workers Party. Um, the PKK directly uh, fought a war against the Turkish government uh, and they were Marxists for a long time. Uh, they have since evolved or said that they have evolved out of that into a, a more horizontal, uh, less hierarchical, uh, you, still using Marxist analysis, but a different way of, of, of structuring their organization. Uh, and the PKK is considered a terrorist organization by the United States, by NATO. Um, it was a precursor to Turkey joining uh, NATO that they basically held over our heads and said, you have to rec the United States needs to recognize the PKK as a terrorist organization if we're going to join. Um, and a civil war was fought. Over 40,000 people died. Um, you know, villages were bombed by the Turkish government. The PKK set off car bombs. It was a, it was a bloody and vicious civil war um, that, is, that reached a peace deal a couple of years ago, but spawned 
a whole new generation of leftist thinking in the region. Um, so you have this group of people called the Kurds, uh, who are splayed through four different nations. They're in Iran, they're in Syria, they're in northern Iraq, and they're in Turkey. And for the longest time, they've demanded their own homeland, their own autonomous area where they can live. And the governments of those four countries have decimated them, exploited them. So, for example, in Turkey, it's illegal, or it has been illegal for over 40 years to speak Tur or to Kurdish. Kurdish. You can't speak it. Uh, you can go to jail for that. Um, to, to sing your own songs or eat your own food, like you just, you can't do those things. So, one of the leaders, this guy named Abdullah Achalan, uh, came out of this movement and was a big part of the PKK for a long time until he was in prison in 1999. He's on this island in the middle of Turkey. And uh, during that period, he went through a mind evolution. And he began reading books by um, a very famous American e ecologist and anarchist named Bur Murray Bookchin. Uh, and out of reading Murray Bookchin, he came to believe that there were some key uh, changes that needed to happen with the ideology and the framework of how the PKK was, was, was approaching things. Um, so probably the most, like radical thing that, that he advocated was the idea that at the core of every decision-making process should be ecology and feminism. Or, or, or the flip side of that, like thinking about how patriarchy affects us and how ecology is an opportunity to, to address issues. Uh, and this is something that began to be pushed into all the decision-making processes of the PKK and its later evolutions. So why is this important to Syria? Well, uh, Syria is dealing with a massive climate crisis, it's dealing with a massive civil war, and it's dealing with an incredibly paternalistic and patriarchal society. So addressing these things, it's almost like his ideology or this idea was perfectly set up for Syria. And in fact, it was developed for Turkey, but has spread to the Kurds in Syria. Um, so there's debate among the United States and among a lot of like intellectual thinkers about whether or not the PKK has actually left behind their, their former Marxist framework, their Cold War Soviet style uh, framework. Personally, I think that they have. Um, there is some evidence to the contrary. But I think in terms of Syria, what we have seen is that there's one organization, one group of people that are actually beating ISIS on, on a regular basis. And it is the people of Rojava, the Kurds of Rojava. And, and one of the reasons that they're doing this is because they're involving everybody in the society. So there is, um, well, before I get to that, I just want to highlight a couple of things. So one, another one of the frameworks that is really important within um, democratic confederalism is this concept of mutual aid. And mutual aid comes from a person named Peter Kropotkin. He was a contemporary of Darwin. He's a, a very famous anarchist, uh, deep thinker, went to Siberia and did all kinds of nature studies and natural history for five years and, and came up with um, this opposite idea of, you know, Darwin had, talks about competition uh, as, as, a, as a massive part of natural selection. Um, Kropotkin actually argued it wasn't competition that makes people survive, it's mutual aid. And he said, like, look at, look at animal species. Do the animals that compete with each other and kill off one side, the other side's injured or wounded, do they have a higher likelihood of succeeding? Or is it the ones that work together and cooperate? Do they have a higher likelihood of succeeding? And that's basically the simple idea about mutual aid, is the idea that as opposed to competition, we can actually work with each other and we have a higher likelihood of success if we work together. And so that's like a key component uh, within democratic con confederalism. Um, and also, there's a core part of challenging capitalism, um, which, you know, I feel like being involved in the left in the last seven years, we went from, like, capitalism can never be overcome to, like, this, this place where it's kind of like a joke, like, we don't even need to mention it. Um, like, of course, we're, that's what we're doing. We're here to challenge it. What's happening in Syria right now is, like, really fascinating, and so reading between the lines um, is really important. So, for example, the first bombing that happened, the United States did, uh, in Syria was actually trying to protect uh, the Sinjar mountain area, which is in Rojava. And uh, there was a daring night mission that happened where a number of Kurds went and rescued this group of people called the Yazidis. They're a small, uh, small religious sect that uh, was targeted, and, and ISIS wants to wipe them out off the map. They're not convertible. They're not people that can become Sunni Muslims. They don't fit into the Islamic State. 
uh, they must be killed. And the Kurds actually rescued 10,000 of these Yazidis, and then out of that, a lot of new recruits came. And this began this storyline of the Kurds actually standing up for Christians and, and Muslims and Jews and atheists. They're actually atheists living in the Middle East openly. There are trans people living in Rojava openly. There is a large queer community in Rojava that is, that is safe and, is, and, and tolerated, not even tolerated, but embraced and encouraged. Um, and then that brings us to patriarchy and women. I thought this is a really cool picture because this is actually from the Spanish Civil War. And this is from 2012 in Rojava. Um, and in the Spanish Civil War, there were civil defense units that were run by women, all women. And so there were units of women that fought. Um, and the same thing exists in Rojava. So in the Rojava Constitution, it's not called a constitution, but in their, their framework of agreements, there is to be 50-50 representation uh, for male and female within governmental structures. Um, at any position, there are two positions. So if you have a governor or whatever of a region, there has to be an advisor on both sides. It's a male and a female. Um, and the women are voted on and chosen by women. And there's a lot of critiques within like um, the radical left in the United States about this. I would just remind everybody uh, that what we think isn't always what works for somebody else. And these people are fighting a war, and they're also... Um, practicing and putting together ideas on the ground that are working, that are not some theory-based things in some hall of a university. This is actual human beings interacting with each other. So as we have our criticism, let's like step back and check ourselves on that before we have reactions to what I'm about to say. So um, these within the Constitution, these things are banned. Child slavery, forced marriage, domestic violence, honor killings, polygamy. They actually have female units dedicated to each individual one of these as investigatory units. So like a weird FBI police force that also like goes into homes and focuses on domestic violence. They do education uh, trainings. They, I mean, it's just incredible some of the things that they're able to do while they're being shelled by ISIS. Um, the belief is that sexism is a root cause of systemic oppression and slavery that uh, unless we understand this and we start addressing this on a root cause, we can't actually do this. Another key part of this that is uh, more of a feminist framework is decentralized power. That in every decision-making process, they're asking themselves, how can we not have this go up another level? How can we make this decision ourselves? How can the people who are directly affected by this be the ones who make the decision about it? Um, and then refugees. So uh, this is actually a demographic challenge as of a couple of, like two months ago. As of two months ago, um, Rojava itself is experiencing some serious challenges. They're having more female refugees than male refugees. Um, and that pr produces any number of problems, although the framework of their society is actually like helping them stabilize that a little more because they have all jobs are open to women. All, all parts of society are open to women, so it's not like they're saying, well, we need more men to fight. Like, well, they're, the, the PYJ, which is the women's uh, militias, they're they're fighting and they're and so and I would also say like it's interesting the Western media has picked up like even the Army Times had a cover story on the PYJ which is the women's fighting group so you, so like they, they pick out women who are like a certain type of attractive in the Western media right and like what they think will get will gain like attention and they're you know Fox News is even talking about this. They don't want to ever talk about why these women are fighting or what they're standing for, or where their culture comes from. But they're like, look, it's a sexy woman with an AK-47. Isn't that cool? Next topic. Um, so that's something like that we need to also just be thinking about that's happening uh, and being utilized within our media. The refugees, the refugee problem is um, both challenging within the Middle East, but as Malcolm X said, uh, the chickens are coming home to roost. And... Those chickens are now tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees streaming into Europe through broken uh, border systems in Greece. So there's a you know your own economic challenge that's happened from the from the economic crisis. Like the Greeks can't even uh, have functioning borders. Um, so that's leading to a whole influx because Greece is part of Europe, and the northern border of Greece doesn't have the checkpoints that the southern border of Greece is supposed to have. And so you're seeing places like Germany talk about taking up to one million refugees over the next two years. Um, you're seeing major 
expenditures of military uh, funding and demands within those countries. For example, Poland just added another $15 million to their military budget, which doesn't sound like much to us because that's like 15 bombs, but to Poland, it's a pretty big deal. Um, and this is a picture of, of actual Syrian refugees coming into Lesbos um, off the Greek coast. And I mean, I can a lot of these things we can talk about afterwards. I don't want to keep talking, but uh, if you have questions about like the, the current refugee crisis and what that's looking like, we can talk more about that. Um, cool. Damn, this didn't come in as well as I wanted to. These are the top 20 uh, climate slash conflict areas. I'm sorry, it's not the greatest, but this is uh, what the U.S. military is projecting for top places. What's interesting is that like th there's a reason for this, but it's interesting because the Middle East is not like highlighted on that, yeah. um, those are already conflict areas. So <laughs> these are potential conflict areas in the future um, to add to our already existing ones. Uh, and most of these are based on lack of access to water uh, or, or closeness to flood and um, storm surge areas. Um, but yeah, so disaster activism. So um, again, I don't want to trivialize this and say that like this conflict was caused by climate change, and I don't want to, to to tell us that like all we need to do is pull our bootstraps up and suck it up, and we'll be fine. Um, but I think that I think that we've been reactionary for so long in our organizing, in our political work, and we need to we need to start having ten year plans. I'm not talking like Soviet style. In your plans, I'm talking like vision. I'm talking alternatives. We don't have to make the case anymore in the United States that climate change is real. Those people who are denialists, they're done. They're over. That we have, in the last three years, we have won that battle. It is not going back. But when those people who do change and come to us and ask us, okay, so I believe in climate change, what do we do? And we say, ah, oh, uh. But I mean, we need to have alternatives and there are folks that are thinking about it but we need to be thinking about this in ourselves like what are those alternatives that we're offering when we shut down logging in the North Pacific Northwest and we make all kinds of young white men unemployed those young white men have kids those kids are the ones who live in Oregon and live over here in our cities that are losing employment these are kids who grew up with their dads being pushed out because of a spotted owl we whether or not we're accountable for that we have to deal with that we have to work through that. When we say, like, you shouldn't drill in the Arctic, we need to offer those $85,000 a year union-paid jobs that shell workers have. We need to find them another alternative. I'm not saying it's all on us, but we need to be thinking about those things, or we're going to have blowback. We're going to have this in five, ten years. We'll fix one problem and create two more. So our vision needs to expand. It's interesting. We've been talking a lot about police brutality uh, and how police have, like, this dangerous job, right? It's actually one of the safer jobs like landscaping is more dangerous number one number two jobs climate change jobs one of them's logging number two coal so the jobs that are being done the arguments already made for these people they know their jobs are not safe what would they be what you know like what if there was an alternative for them to do something else you know klein's awesome corporate history of disaster capitalism uh, i mean that's essentially like that's what capitalism is. It's an opportunistic take advantage of situations when things go bad. Like, how do we how do we make a profit out of this? How do we monetize this? When when Katrina happened, the first thing that went in in terms of reconstruction was new. They leveled they leveled all these poor neighborhoods that they could say were like not safe. They put in all these resort areas. You know, that's what's and that's what happened in the Rockaways in New York. Like, when there's climate crises. Um, you know, Iraq is a, is an exa example of 9/11 being used as an opportunity. Right? They had those things on the on the on the they had the book sitting on the wall waiting for an opportunity to be able to do it. And when nine eleven happened, it was like, Oh, there's our opportunity. We can get more money to the police. We can crack down on, on political dissent in this country. We can invade and occupy oil fields, like we can get resources. They all wanted those things, but they didn't have the opportunity to do them. We should be thinking about that too. We should be thinking about like when the banks fail, what's our alternative to that? so that people are coming to us for solutions. When, and that's an extreme example, but like in this community, what would it have been like if we had had a framework and a movement already when the police officer shot two young black men? As opposed to having to create that framework in crisis, what would that look like to have that beforehand and be ready to go and ready to say, you know what, actually we need these three things and you're gonna do it right now, Mr. Mayor and City Council, and you're gonna do it or else we're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna take these steps, you know?
we've been in working on that and creating that, and good work goes into that, but I want to see that vision. Turning the historical page, vision versus, I mean, and this is a, uh, this is a uh, celebration after the, uh, the elections four months ago in Turkey. They just had new elections, but this is a celebration. The Kurdish party got 15% of the vote, and for the first time was actually um, reflected in the Turkish parliament. For a long time, the Turkish government had just been this, the AKP party, which is, a, they call themselves the Peace and Justice Party. Um, it's, a, it's an Islamist uh, framework government that is like top-down, very dictatorial, um, repressive, unless you're a Turk. Uh, but this was a, a celebration. These are all <coughs> colors and flags from the, from the Rojava region, the PYG and the PYJ. And this is in like Istanbul, so it's come a long way. The current um, one says Azadi, which means freedom. Liberty and field yeah, right there. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that is my presentation. Um, and I'm totally down to take questions and chat through stuff. Okay. Yeah. What, what is, uh, what's, uh, what, you said ISIS is uh, coming down on Rojava. What's like Americans and Turks and the uh, Iranians and all them? What's their, like, what are they doing about Rojava? Yeah, so the question was, uh, so. The question was like ISIS is, is going after Rojava. What is what are all the other players in the region? Iran, Syria, Turkey, United States. What's what's the the framework? What's happening between them? Basically? Yeah, I'm just wondering what yeah. their policies are. Um, their... Okay, so first and foremost, it's important to understand that uh, <laughs> there are a lot of different alliances. There's 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 two different things that are important. Shifting. Yeah, <laughs> the United States and Russia are battling each other for influence in the region as well as Iran and Saudi Arabia. And so Iran is allied with Russia. Saudi Arabia is aligned with the United States. So everything that's happening in this region has to do with that relation, that, that game that's being played. Um, and you want to add to that? Go ahead. What is it when you say, uh, I mean, like, but I mean, like all sorts of people are still funding money to ISIS when you say that, like, with those allies? Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just... Yeah, no, and so, so like... Within that is within that nuance is like some crazy more nuance. So like the United States is fighting ISIS. The United States also wants to fight Bashar al-Assad. Assad and ISIS are fighting each other. So we chose to stop fighting Assad and start fighting ISIS. ISIS is funded by Saudi Arabia, who is our ally. Saudi Arabia has like provided a lot of the educational tools that help ISIS with its ideology. So Wahhabism, which is like an extreme form of Islam. It's it's where Al-Qaeda came out of. That ideology created Al-Qaeda. Al um, it was first really pushed in the Middle East outside of Saudi Arabia in Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation and led to the Taliban, led to Al-Qaeda, and now has led to ISIS. So a lot of people view, a lot of a lot of critics view Saudi Arabia as one of the chief problems in the region. Um, because they're a funder of this like extreme Wahhabist ideology, um, and a lot of like uh, I don't know real politic American observers, people who aren't radicals but they're not like right wingers either, would would say that we should stop funding Saudi Arabia because it might have an effect on like the wars that we're fighting in these other regions. Um, but we want and need oil, and Saudi Arabia guarantees a stable price of that, and that's important for our world markets. So, um, probably not going to happen. I mean, Saudi Arabia is currently bombing Yemen, uh, which is a with country our, on their, with our, with our bombs weapons. and planes and weapons. They've got the fifth largest military in the world. So in this case, what's interesting about Israel is that Israel is just kind of staying in the sidelines, like <coughs> clapping. A lot of their enemies are fighting each other. <laughs> And um, they, I think, strategically understand that when they get involved overtly with things in the Middle East, like it can create alliances against them that they don't want. So I think Israel's framework right now is not to mention the fact that they're dealing with their own massive internal uprisings right now, but like Israel's perspective is to really like not get involved with what's happening in Syria. There's been a couple of airstrikes, but they've been, you know, and they like for example, Hezbollah which is calls for the you know goodbyeness of Israel. Hezbollah is being allowed to fight ISIS by Israel. Israel could very easily bomb the Hezbollah camps, but they're not. They're choosing to turn a blind eye and let them go. So the enemy of my greater enemy is not so much a friend, but you know 
we're not going to stop them. Hezbollah is aligned with Iran, <laughs> Iran's aligned with Syria, <laughs> Syria is aligned with Russia, and that's why Russia now has warplanes dropping bombs in Syria out of bases in Syria. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I would just, as a side note, I, I would challenge, like, would challenge us all to like engage in this issue and not and not just like feel overwhelmed by the complexity of it. Um, I think that our government expects us to not engage on this, and they rely on us not to engage on this, and allows them to continue to do things. I mean, like you know, 50 years ago, it was unheard of for a president to say like we will not have boots on the ground, and then to reverse that. The first time to to do that was Vietnam. And now it's become like a very common practice of saying, of course we won't have boots on the ground in Syria. And that was a year and a half ago, you know. Today, or they're this week. Advisors. You know. <laughs> yeah, now they're advisors, now they're embrace, now they're calling in airstrikes, and now they're shooting people. So um, the last thing, whatever your perspective is, I don't think that there's anyone that can make a compelling case for physical intervention by the United States in Syria. Um, there are some credible leftists <laughs> that I respect that call for no-fly zones administered by the United States government. I'm not saying that's necessarily how I feel. I'm an abolitionist, and I don't believe in the U.S. military uh, as a force for intervention. However, there, this is a really complicated issue. It's not cut and dry, and, and our alternatives can't just be like, no war, no war. Well, 400,000 are dead. Like, what? at what point does it become something that, that the world community needs to involve itself in? You had mentioned at one point um, proxies. Yeah. In these wars. I was wondering, is there anybody writing about, you know, because I'm guessing it must exist, multinational corporations such as Nestle yeah. using governments as their proxies? Yeah. Um, there absolutely are. Uh, yeah, David Graeber out of, I mean, it depends on, like, what framework you want for this, but David Graeber's talked a lot about that. He talks a lot about debt as well. He's a and anarchist anthropologist out of um, the UK. Curious, the slide you had of the 20 expected yeah. spots to blow up in the yeah. future. One was New Orleans, but it, the other one, it was there was a dot somewhere down in the south southeast. But the, the what said it was was off the screen. So what was the second? So one, I mean, one of the things for like the south, this one of the ch key challenges for the Gulf Coast to Florida region is that the water is warming so it's like it's climate change but it's really ocean acidification so as we when we pump carbon into the atmosphere 30 percent of it actually goes in the ocean it doesn't go into the atmosphere so that is a, a more immediate scientists tell us that's a more immediate challenge than global warming or climate change itself because we're losing massive amounts of fish species it's why our oysters are dying off in the pacific northwest it's one of the theories behind why we have sea star wasting disease um, but ultimately, it's just raising the temperature of the ocean. And when a hurricane comes in, and it slows when it's warmer water, and it gets bigger, and it hits harder. And so, in those two examples, that's that's what they're talking about. They're talking about like flooding, but really more storm surges, like emergency situations like that. So, uh, we talk about us in disaster capitalism. What form is us or disaster capitalism taking place in the U.S. at this time? Is this new? A couple of people's idea, or is it an organization of any sort? Um, you mean disaster activism? Yeah. Uh, so disaster capitalism has been as long as capitalism has been around. But disaster activism, uh, I, again, like I don't. Nobody's really used that term. That's something I've been using, and I don't. I, for the life of me, don't know when or who came up with it. It's off of Naomi Klein's thoughts, though. So Naomi Klein wrote two books that were key to this, the first one was the shock doctrine, or the rise of disaster capitalism, and that articulated how capitalism does these things, and used examples, and then her newest book, uh, This Changes Everything, about climate change versus capital, or climate versus capital, capitalism versus climate, um, that articulated that we can, that yes, they, the system uses that framework, we can flip it, and we can use it for vision and opportunity. Um, so so we, it's not an organization. The we is like the people of the world who are not directly engaging in, you know, okay, Nestle's so board of directors. Yeah. So it's the people of the world, and we need to organize coalitions and uh, networks, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, to give it focus and, uh, and direction. Yeah, I think... Um, I think like a lot of the shell no work that's happened recently. I mean, what we saw in the Pacific Northwest with y'all know what I'm talking about when I say shell no. Yes, like yeah. the Shell Corporation trying to drill in the Arctic. Um, 
a lot of that work that we saw was like, oh, people hanging from bridges and people in kayaks and that's sexy and is awesome uh, and should be lifted up. And also, you know, 30 years of indigenous resistance set the groundwork in Alaska for that. Like if we didn't have people or like indigenous people organizing with union reps and creating the places where we slept in Alaska, where we were able to, to, to make those in, initial connections, the first name basises, or like the work that's happening with the coal and oil trains right now is a coalition of like multiple different groups. It's not just where the coal export terminal happens, it's where the extraction point is, it's the transfer point, it's the, um, it's the ship off point, it's the reception on the other side of the world point, and it's then the distribution point. So there's like five points of intervention and getting people at all those levels. So I think that's like an example of the vision um, yeah. going forward. But I just wondered if there was more uh, body to it to, in terms of organization, not in terms of concept. Right. The disaster activism makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We all have a common opposition, which is the climate, which is what we're causing. We're all taking right. part in that. Right. So yeah, two things on that. I think one, um, it's a new, newer, newish concept, and it's uh, that's fine, and and so we're evolving on that. And and I, the second part is I, uh, it's not us. Uh, all of us in this room, for the rest of our lifetime, cannot do as much damage as Lockheed Martin did in the last five seconds. But in terms of part infrastructure that buys gas, right. that pays taxes, totally real, et cetera, yes, et cetera. yes. And uh, I think that the self-flagellation that we do on the left, where we like make ourselves incapable of doing anything because we're like, oh god, if I don't, I, I drove in a car today and I, I should have <laughs> rode my bicycle and like all oh, the roads you want like. Like I'm sorry, we can't be paralyzed by this. That's we need to understand there are there are people that are guilty, and there are people that need to be held accountable. And we're going to have an open heart to them to evolve. And when they don't evolve, we'll do something else with them. But like for the most for the most part, people are just born into a system, and they are trying to survive. They're trying to feed their kids. They're trying to live and give their next generation a chance. I don't I don't want us to think like, like let's not fall into that trap um, that paralyzes us because they benefit from that. When we're all, you know, like that's, that was what they said about the, the stuff in Seattle. They said like, oh, your, your kayaks are made of oil. It's like, yes. Do you have an alternative? No. That's what we want as an alternative. That's right. We've got to work it out. Yeah. yeah. Got to flip it. I'd, I'd like to respond to that just a little bit is, uh, I think there's, there's a larger conceptual shift that we need to make. Uh, I was talking with Aaron about this the other day, is that we have a tendency to uh, think of politics as something you do uh, every first Tuesday in November, and then there's like a, a media this show. This Tuesday, there, there's a media show that leads up to that, and that, and it's really about the two mainstream capitalist parties, and and uh, you know, but we need to, you know, remind ourselves that it's politics is an everyday activity, and and the emphasis on activity, it's not something that is you know. Uh, an election day phenomenon and who wins and who loses and then we just wait for them either branch of the capitalist parties to, to take care of things for us it's got to be uh, you know something that we're all engaged in constantly uh, you know week after week day after day year after year and you know we need to kind of shift our consciousness and get others around us to to understand that Politics is the life of the community, the polis, not you know uh, uh, reduced to you know the, the conflict between two uh, capitalist political parties, and and so once we kind of get that in place, then then we're empowered to do the sort of thing that that Graham is talking about, to to build organization and connections, and to wield power in the streets, because uh, as Howard Zinn once said. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It matters who's in the streets. Around and, it. And, yeah. and uh, so, yeah. We heard some facts and figures. Now, how does it relate to us, we, the people, here and now? Let's talk about vision instead of reaction. You gave example earlier of how to, you know, people of color get shot and what to do, there was a solution. It will be next year, it will be fourth year. We're already doing it for three years called Justice No Jails Project. And irony, that day, 
Justice of the Thurston County was supposed to be with us and we did the presentation and got cancelled and a few other things, Law and Justice Council got cancelled and Justice Not Jail's project meeting when he, were, he was going to come and show us what we have shown to the county commissioners how the, the pipeline you know, to prison and it, locking them up and throwing away the key and then we bearing the burden is not a solution. So talking about a vision. So I want you to take this fact and let that sink in. Out of the last 239 years, we have been at war, a paradigm of death and destruction. I should not call it a war. I should call it for what it is. In a context, we can understand a paradigm of death and destruction for 222 years. Out of 239 years of our young country's history, 222 years we have been in a paradigm of death and destruction, otherwise known as war. Brother Grant Klumpner just said, you know, we cannot, all of us collectively, even these millions of us, cannot, cannot do the damage to the environment what Raytheon can do in a few seconds. So either we are intellectually intellectually dishonest when we talk about climate change and we do not talk about war. Nothing destroys the environment and, and this wonderful world, our great mother, like war, the paradigm of death and destruction. So we need to look at it. There will be, the climate change might not be there. If we did not use this, I remember a Texas billionaire saying, there's no activity on the planet which uses oil and fossil fuels like war. And so one of the examples for an alternative in this region is the work that's happening at Coffee Strong. And so over the last six years, Coffee Strong has been really focused on developing a community around active duty and veteran personnel of all generations uh, with our civilian counterparts to actually challenge issues in this region. Uh, we're evolving with the military situation and we're asking, you know, one of the reasons we had this fundraiser today is we're asking this community to invest in something that's happening locally, that's addressing militarism, that's going to be addressing more and more climate justice in this region and internationally. So we're not only asking folks in this room to contribute financially, we're also asking folks to contribute with their feet and their hearts in this movement. Um, but the work that's happening in this region is going to determine what kind of what kind of, I mean, we set the example for the rest of the United States. We passed marijuana first. We passed gay marriage first. We fought off Shell and stopped drilling in the Arctic. We're taking out dams that 10 years ago it was like ludicrous, the idea you take out a dam. This region is setting lines. There's 18 projects that, are going for, that we're going forward from Oregon to British Columbia to ship coal, oil, and natural gas out of here. It's not happening. All 18 of them are tied up in the courts, being canceled, being obstructed, being occupied. People in this region are stepping up, and the rest of the world's watching. The rest of the world is paying attention using our tactics and our tools. 